Don Hawk says the ball is rolling for Julio Castroneves to potentially race in Daytona 500 in 2023, and Chicago Speedway might be making its return in 2023. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. The data NASCAR and other motorsports stories included in today's video. Let's go into some sharing those really, really quickly. Let's start go ahead and start our paint schemes and sponsorship news first. Let's jump in those really, really quickly. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Brett Moffat's 2022 Red Half Off Wholesale Scheme that I believe we're going to see this weekend at Nashville Super Speedway. Honestly, I think the paint scheme looks really, really cool. I've been a big fan of the Half Off Wholesale Schemes that Brett Moffat's had. Hope we have a good run in this car this weekend at Nashville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Timmy Hill's 2022 Cobalt Enterprises scheme that we see this weekend at Nashville. This one's a little bit different than the other Cobalt Enterprises schemes. Of course, Cobalt Enterprises has sponsored Timmy Hill pretty much a lot of this season. Really awesome to continue to sponsor him and hope you all have a good run this weekend in this truck. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Tyler Reddick's 2022 Lady A Summer Scheme that we're going to see in the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Nashville. Honestly, I really love this paint scheme. It looks really, really awesome. The difference, the wacky color brands, but I think it looks absolutely amazing. I think they did a really awesome job on it. I'm looking forward to seeing the race track this weekend at Nashville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Max Gutierrez's 2022 Tough Build Scheme that we're going to see in the Truck Series race tonight at Nashville. Of course, Max Gutierrez is driving the 22 tonight in substitution for Austin himself. This looks really, really good. Very similar to the 37 truck. I was a big fan of that truck, though. They did a good job on this paint scheme. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Bubba Wallace's 2022 Root Insurance Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Nashville. This one's a little bit different because they've actually changed it, kind of gone back to the old Root Insurance colors they used to have last year. I think this looks really, really awesome. Glad that Root Insurance is continuing to have an entire sponsor with Bubba Wallace. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Chris Hacker's 2022 Morgan & Morgan scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Nashville. Really awesome Morgan & Morgan that they're actually sponsoring Chris Hacker. I think that's something that's really, really fun to be honest with you. Hopefully Chris will have a good run this weekend at Nashville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Loss Allen's 2022 AutoDocket.com scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Nashville. Now, I'm going to say under the fact that Loss Allen always has some ways to find different sponsors, and cool to see that AutoDocket.com is going to sponsor him this weekend at Nashville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ryan Blaney's 2022 Advanced Auto Parts scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Nashville. This one is a little bit different because instead of a gold yellow number they've generally had they're going to be running a red number on this car honestly i think this actually looks a lot better than the other one i like the other one better don't a lot but i think this one absolutely looks a lot better and they should probably run this game a lot more to be honest with you the next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Austin Center's 2022 Duracell Menard scheme that we see this weekend at Nashville. Not much is here other than the fact that basically the only thing that's different is basically the Duracells on the front of the car. It's awesome that Duracell is sponsoring Austin Center though, and hopefully Austin Center will have a good run in this car. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Kyle Seeks' 2022 Night Owl scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Nashville in his return to the NASCAR Xfinity Series. This looks pretty good in my opinion, very similar to the other Night Owl schemes. It's really not much different. It's good to see Night Owls continue their partnership with Kyle Seeks this weekend. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ryan Priest's 2022 Hunt Brothers Pizza scheme that we're going to see tonight in the NASCAR Camp Road Truck Series at Na race at Nashville. Honestly, it looks really, really good. I love the Hunt Brothers cars that he's had this year, especially in the Xfinity Series and the Cup Series. This one's no exception. Not much to say other than that. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Mason Massey's 2022 Lost Mago scheme that I believe we're going to see this weekend at Nashville in the Xfinity Series. Honestly, I think it does look really, really solid. I think it looks good and awesome to see that Kyle Mason Massey has a new sponsor for this race. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Natalie Decker's 2022 Nutties Hockey Tonk scheme that we're going to see in the Xfinity Series race at Nashville. This looks pretty cool in my opinion, like the right and red contrast in the car. I think it looks really, really great. I think they did an awesome job on it, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here this weekend in Nashville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ross Chessing's updated 2022 jockey scheme that makes its official debut this weekend at Nashville. The only difference being that basically there is a blue number on the car instead of the white number. Honestly, I think the blue number actually works a lot better than the white number, to be honest with you. I think the blue number one looks really, really great. I think they did an awesome job on it, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing it on the racetrack here this weekend at Nashville. 
The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Jeff Burton's 2022 Hawkins home scheme that we're going to see in the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Nashville. This looks really, really cool in my opinion. Love the different colors they've had on it. I think Jeff Burton's has some really awesome looking sponsorships. It looks really, really awesome, and I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here this weekend at Nashville. The next main scheme we're taking a look at is Derek Krause's 2022 Hunter Nation scheme that I believe we're going to see in the Truck Series race here at Nashville tonight. This looks good in my opinion. Really awesome. Hunter Nation is stepping up. I believe that's the basic thing that the Duck Dynasty group is doing, if I'm not mistaken. Really cool, though, the Hunter Nation is coming in and sponsoring Derek Krause here at Nashville. And the final paint scheme we are taking a look at is Kyle Weatherman's 2022 Era E-Racing Association scheme that we're going to see this weekend in the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Nashville. This looks really, really good in my opinion. I think they did uh, absolutely an awesome job on it. It looks nice, and I'm definitely excited to see on the racetrack here in the Xfinity Series race. As it's also great to see that Kyle Weatherman is going to be back in the car this weekend. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Richmond Truck Race. As they have their title sponsor officially built for the Richmond Truck Race. And it's going to be called the Worldwide Express 250. Worldwide Express has been expanding their partnership in NASCAR. First, they sponsored, of course, Trackhouse Racing. Now they have a partnership, of course, with Nice Motorsports, where they sponsor Carson Osmar and, of course, Dean Thompson. And now they're going to be sponsoring a race. I think it's really awesome. Worldwide Express continues to expand their partnerships, and hopefully we'll see a great race when we do have the race there later this year. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Pocono Xfinity Series race as also their title sponsor has been officially built as it's going to be called the Explore the Pocono Mountains 225. I believe they've generally had this title over the years. I think they've had this in the Xfinity Series in the past, but I think it's awesome that Explore the Pocono Mountains continues to sponsor the series. I think that's, again, I think that's really, really cool that they continue to sponsor the series. I think that's amazing. I'm excited to see how this race is going to be at Pocono for the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the NASCAR Plaza logo. As it was reported by Adam Stern on Wednesday evening that the former NASCAR Plaza building in Charlotte has removed their sign logo. Now, I believe the new NASCAR Plaza is going to be moving down to North Concord, North Carolina. Remember, the new uh, NASCAR Plaza building was based, the old NASCAR Plaza building was in the heart of Charlotte. I believe they're now moving it near the Charlotte Motor Speedway area into the Concord, North Carolina area. Of course, a lot of people are making jokes, of course, when you're basically moving to an area, you're of course going to remove the logo. But I think it's great that they've removed the logo there. I know it's the old plaza building. People are going to remember it for a very, very long time. But I think it's a good decision that they've gone ahead and removed the signage from the building. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Burton Smith. As unfortunately, Wednesday evening at the age of 95, Burton Smith passed away. Burton Smith, of course, the owner and the basically the founder of SMI, the Speedway Motorsports Incorporated, and NASCAR Hall of Famer. Whether you agree with his decisions or not, Burton Smith was an innovator in our sport and made also a ton of amazing decisions in the history. And again, whether you agree with the decision that will happen in North Wilkesboro or not, Burton Smith is a legend. And my prayers and condolences go out to the Smith family during this tragic time. And it's a very sad day for the sport that a NASCAR Hall of Famer like Burton Smith unfortunately passed away. <clears throat> very sad story, unfortunately. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Beyond the Wheel. Remember that Beyond the Wheel show that F basically Fox used to have the Emmy Award winning show that they used to have? Well, last night the Beyond the Wheel show basically made its return. Remember that Quincy special that was supposed to happen? Well, that happened last night. It's basically, I think, Vintage to Vogue. I think that was the first episode. It's going to be a three-episode series. There's going to be one of those coming out later this year. They didn't give exact dates. I've watched the Beyond the Wheel shows in the past, and I have to say I think they generally are really, really solid and really, really good. So I think it's really awesome they've gone ahead and brought the Beyond the Wheel back. I think fans are going to be really happy about that. And obviously that Beyond the Wheel is making its official return. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we got a new rule update to talk about. Now, there was another rule update that kind of came out, but we're not going to get into this. We're talking more about this one because this one is pretty important. This has a lot to do with pick guns. So according to Bob Pockers, as he or Jabozi Tyler Ravik, who does a lot of stuff for NASCAR, doesn't work for NASCAR anymore, but did a lot of stuff for NASCAR, he basically released a report saying that NASCAR has added a rule that now limits that what can, what can be used to remove a seized lawn nuts. The only tool that can be used is the approved emergency pick guns, meaning teams can't really build their own guns. 
to remove the pick equipment. Now, this, I think, is a little bit of a BS rule in some sense. I understand why NASCAR is doing this, but I think this is a little bit of a BS rule because sometimes you can have issues like where Eric Jones, where the they say Lunas are going to get stuck. And we've seen a major Lunas issues this year with a lot of Lunas have had problems. 10 of the 40 teams that currently compete in the Cup Series, 10 of the 39 or 40 teams that so far have at least competed in one race this year, have had issues with the Lunas staying on. And I'm not sure having the approved Lunas is going to fix, just generally fix this problem. I think it's only going to make things generally really, really worse. So I'm not a big fan of this rule change that they've come in and brought in. I understand why they're doing it, but the same token, the same time, because I think it's the same bunny, but the same token, the same time, I'm not as big of a basically a fan of them changing the rules of these pick guns. I think that there need to be ways to address this issue. Again, I don't know if it'll be something that they don't fix until after the season, but hopefully it's something they do go ahead and generally fix. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Nashville attendance. Now, for a lot of people asking about the Nashville attendance, really does not look really, really good. Nick Bromber put out a chart of the Nashville attendance for this year, and there's a lot of empty seats and a lot of seats that are basically still available. And I have to talk about, I think, and why I think the Nashville attendance has been generally really, really bad. I'm going to explain a couple reasons why. Number one, I think the economy is starting to finally catch up a little bit. Sonoma did not have the greatest attendance either, but I think national attendance has gone down there. I think that's a big, no, one big reason. The second reason why I think that this is happening is basically because of what happened last year. Remember last year, people were having a really hard time getting into the racetrack as paid parking was a big issue and a lot of people couldn't get in. Some people didn't even probably get to show up to the race and they actually had to delay the start of the race because of how bad it was. So that's another big reason. The third big reason, though, and this I think is the major reason why, is because of the heat. It's supposed to be almost 100 degrees, and they're not allowing coolers in the track once again. Coolers should have been allowed on the track, and this would not have been an issue. And I should be not surprised that there are people that are not going to show up to these races. So it's not a massive surprise to me, to be honest with you, that attendance is down for this race. It's a shame because of all the issues last year and this year so far. But it is a, a massive shame. But honestly, it is what it is. And I'm not entirely surprised, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Firestone. As it was revealed on Wednesday afternoon that Firestone is going to once again become the exclusive tire supplier for Indy Lights starting in 2023. Firestone stopped working as an exclusive tire supplier back in 2014, and now they're back being the exclusive tire supplier. They, of course, are the exclusive tire supplier for the IndyCar series. They, once again, are the exclusive tire supplier for Indy Lights for the first time in nine years. I think this is really, really huge, especially for those drivers that get used to the tires, especially once they do get out the Indy cars. I don't exactly remember this year what they're using as tires, maybe good years, I'm not entirely sure, but it's good to see that Firestone has become the exclusive tire supplier. It makes sense for them to become it considering they do work in IndyCar, and for the first time in a long time, they will be the exclusive tire supplier for the teams. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Stephen Parsons. As Stephen Parsons is going to drive the 20 for Young's Motorsports in the Truck Series race this weekend at Nashville. We had no confirmation until yesterday who was going to be in it, and now we have confirmation it's going to be Stephen Parsons. Stephen Parsons has made quite a few Truck Series starts very, very recently, and also could be most of us competing for most of the season without prime racing and, of course, BJ McLeod Motorsports this year in 2022 as he's transitioning away from BJ McLeod Motorsports to generally drive for Alpha Prime. Not sure Seven Parsons is going to do. I think this truck is really not in a good position at owner's points right now, considering the truck, I think, has missed quite a few races this year. Hopefully, Seb Parsons can get the truck into the field, and hopefully he can do well enough to have a great run in this race. If he can, I think it'd be a great for this team. Hopefully, he's able to make the field and have an amazing run here. Hopefully, he's able to make the field. And now we're going to head into on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Kyle Larson. Now, it's been kind of unclear who the two pit crew members are going to be that are going to be taking over for the other two pit crew members that have been suspended. Because remember, Clint Daniels and two pit crew members for Kyle Larson have been suspended for the next four weekends. So, Austin Dickey and Alan Holman are going to pit for Kyle Larson for the next four races. Both of them have been part of Corey LaJoy's team, and now they'll be joining in to basically work with Kyle Larson over the next four weekends. Hopefully Kyle Larson can have some good runs. Again, it's kind of four dead weeks. I think Larson fans should be a little bit nervous considering that Kevin Mendering is going to be the crew chief. And I'm going to be honest with you, Kevin Mendering is not the greatest crew chief in the world. Let's just say that. So hopefully he can have a really strong run. Hopefully 
We'll see can these guys help Kyle Larson out a little more. And maybe we won't see any more tire issues, but I'm a little nervous. That we're probably going to see some more tire issues happening here in the future. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about David Sarr. As David Sarr revealed on social media that he is going to miss the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Nashville due to not feeling really, really well. He could come out and say that it was not COVID. He basically had a test, negative test for COVID-19. He's just feeling a little bit under the weather. So B.J. McLeod, who's a good friend of David Sarr's, is going to substitute for him for the next, for this weekend's race. Now, this will be B.J. McLeod's first start with SS Greenlight Racing, I think, in a very, very long time. And also, I believe, his first start with the team this year. Of course, substituting for David Starr. I'm not sure what B.J. McLeod is going to do, but I'm wishing the best for David Starr as he recovers from whatever he's got. So, he'll be back next weekend at, well, because he's only back next week in Road America, this is going to be, I believe, Andy Lally. So, hopefully, over the next couple weeks, David Starr does recover from his sickness, and hopefully, we'll see him back in the track in the future. I'm not sure how it's going to do once he does come back, but hopefully he'll do well enough to have some good runs here in the future. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Steven Malazzi. As it was revealed yesterday that Steve Malazzi is going to be making his truck series debut in about a week or two at Mid Ohio. Driving to 43 for the Ram Brothers Racing Organization. Steve Malazzi, for those of you who not know, is currently a development driver for the Ram Brothers Racing Organization and was a former employee of the Ram <clears throat> Brothers Racing Organization. And now he gets an opportunity to race and make his NASCAR Truck Series debut. This is a really cool opportunity for Steven. He's been working really, really hard. He currently races the layout models, has some decent success over there. And I think this is an amazing and a great opportunity for a guy like Steven to get some really, really awesome and some real-world experience out on the racetrack in NASCAR. I hope he does really, really well. It'd be awesome to see him cross that finish line first, and hopefully we're going to see him get an opportunity to race because I think it'd be awesome if he got a shot to contend. Hopefully he'll have a good run in at that number 43 truck for the Ram Brothers Racing Organization. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Kevin Harvick. As it was revealed yesterday, Dustin Long reported this, that there have been some pit crew changes that have been made for Kevin Harvick. So Daniel Coffey and Brandon Banks, who both, I believe, used to work with Chase Briscoe's organization, are now moving away from Chase Briscoe's organization and working with Kevin Harvick. I think one of the big reasons why this happened is if you watched Sonoma a couple weeks ago, you probably saw that Kevin Harvick had a really strong chance to win the race, had a really fast car, and the car was almost quicker than Chris Busher's. But unfortunately, Kevin Harvick had a bad pit stop near the end, and Kevin Harvick was really, really upset and really, really angry with the pit crew. And that's why I think they've gone ahead and made these pit crew changes. The last couple of weeks, Kevin Harvick has shown a lot more pace and a lot more speed. So if they can get the pit crew issue solved at Stuart Haas Racing, especially with Kevin Harvick, I think Kevin Harvick does have a really strong opportunity and a really strong possibility of contending for potentially some more victories going forward. So Kevin Harvick is still on, I think he's on a 59 race winless streak. He's still looking for his first victory in nearly two years. I think it's very possible he continues to maybe if he'll have a good run, have an opportunity to do well. But I'm really hoping that Kevin Harvick and the team can turn it around. Maybe it's pick crew changes are going to be the, the thing that really helps him get an opportunity to generally contend. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Dale Jr. Now, Dale Jr. was actually at North Wilkesboro about a day or two ago. He's actually testing one of his old late model cars. And Dale Jr. made some laps at North Wilkesboro and says he had a lot of fun at the track. During an interview, by the way, Dale Jr. actually did say that he is hoping to have two cars at the track in August in hopes and he plans to race in August at North Wilkesboro. Now, Dale Jr. has been following him very, very closely. He has said this for a while that he is ultimately looking to try to get in back into racing at North Wilkesboro. North Wilkesboro, of course, a very iconic track, is going to be returning with racing once again for the first time in many, many years. The first time we'll be racing in over a decade. So I think that's something that's really, really awesome. What's also, I think, really, really awesome is the fact that Dale Jr. is looking to be one of the drivers who does make an opportunity to, to come back and race. So I really am excited to see what Dale Jr. can do when he comes back. Again, I know that Dale Jr. is a big fan of North Wilkesboro. He's a big fan of history. And he was the one that really helped <clears throat> kind of prompt North Wilkesboro to really come back. So I think it's really cool to see that he's going to probably make some starts at North Wilkesboro later this year. Dale Jr. is such an iconic name. Again, it comes out of time. I think Josh Berry is also probably going to make some starts at North Wilkesboro. It's not confirmed, but I believe he's going to also make some starts at North Wilkesboro as well here in the future. So 
I'm excited to see if Dale Jr. is looking to come back. I think it's amazing to see that he's looking to, to come back and race, and hopefully he will make some starts later this year at North Wilkesboro. Whether it's only one or two starts, it doesn't matter. He wants to race in North Wilkesboro due to the history, and how the Dale Jr. does get that opportunity to race at North Wilkesboro. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Felix Rosenquist. As it was revealed yesterday that Felix Rosenquist has officially signed a contract extension with McLaren. It did not was not confirmed we'll be returning to Air McLaren SP in 2023 or if he'll be moving back over to Formula E. Now, Felix Rosenquist currently drives the number seven for Air McLaren SP and has had some solid runs this year with Air McLaren SP, but has not been up to the level of a guy like Pato Award. We already know the Pat Award and Alexander Ross are going to be driving for the team in 2023. And it's been unclear if Felix Rosquist is going to come back. Now, McLaren, like I mentioned, does have a Formula E team. And funny thing, Felix Rosquist, before coming over and racing IndyCar for Chip Ganassi Racing back in 2018 or 2019, he drove in Formula E and won quite a few races. Well, in fact, I think he won a championship in Formula E as well. So I think Formula E fans are really going to be pleased <clears throat> if a guy like Felix Rosenquist comes back. But if he does come back to Aaron McLaren SP next year in a third car, because we know at this point the Aaron McLaren SP, Aaron McLaren wants to re-expand and have a third car in the future. But I think it'd be absolutely incredible and amazing if they did go ahead and basically try to get Felix Rosenquist back in one of the Aaron McLaren SP cars. I think it'd be great. But I also think, like I mentioned, there's a very strong possibility that Felix Rosenquist could absolutely 1,000% drive one of the McLaren cars in at Formula E. I think it would have a team at like Oliver Askin, unless Oliver is still, of course, driving for Andretti Autosport. I think it'd be amazing, though, if Felix did get an opportunity to go back to Formula E. Again, I'd like to see him. Don't get me wrong. I definitely would like to see Felix Rosenquist get a great opportunity to race in one of the one of the Indy cars, again, with Aaron McLaren SP. But like I said, there's a very strong possibility that he will not return to Aaron McLaren SP in 2023. But he would drive a one of the McLaren cars in the future. So we'll wait and see what happens and what does get announced in the future. But it's very potential that he will not be returning, at least in Aaron McLaren SP, but be in McLaren's Formula E program. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Tilly. As it was announced on Wednesday afternoon, a Kyle Tilly making his season debut next weekend at Road America driving the 78 for Live Fast Motorsports. I've been kind of wondering when Kyle Tilly was going to make a start because we know that Kyle Tilly has been driving for this team pretty much all of la ran, ran a lot of the road course races last year. I know he ran a Road America last year. I know he ran a Circuit Americas last year and also ran at the Indy Road Course last year. I know his performances were not absolutely great, but I think Kyle Tilly is a very, very solid driver. And with this car being more like a road course car nowadays, I think it definitely makes a ton of sense for him to get an opportunity to race in one of their cars. Now, ultimately, I'd like to see him have a good shot at contending and see what he can do in the car. Again, I think this is a really cool opportunity for Kyle Tilly. He's also got a really cool sponsor that he's got for this race. I think this is a really strong opportunity. Again, I'm very excited to see he's going to be back with the team for the first time in a very, very long time. Again, it's not, he hasn't raced at all this year. I was expecting him to come back, but it's been a while. So I think it's great that he's back with Live Fast Motorsports, and hopefully he'll do really, really well with Live Fast Motorsports. Hopefully he has a good enough run with the team, to be honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about F1's new potential TV deal. Now, we've already covered this on the channel multiple times, but there's been kind of an update in regards to F1 TV deal. So, according to Adam Stern, the word in Montreal was that decision is now closed and there are three serious bidders currently bidding for the deal. Disney, which owns ESPN and ABC, so ESPN and ABC is one of the networks. The second one is NBC Comcast, and the third one is Amazon Prime. Now, we've known that ESPN and NBC and Amazon Prime are the three biggest potential networks to come back. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, which network do I want to see come back, or what network do I want to see basically take over the coverage? I'm going to explain here very, very quickly what network I want to see. And it's very, very simple and a very, very simple answer. The answer is I want to see ESPN and NBC come back because they I believe the executive of ESPN has said, executive vice president has said that if they do get the coverage back, they're going to do their best that if they have to have any sort of commercials with the fees that potentially come in, they said they only have side by side and not any full screen commercials. What I'm worried with is that if NBC gets the coverage back and if or Amazon Prime gets it back, I'm very worried that there are going to be commercials. And one thing the Formula One fans do not want is commercials. 
One thing that has been really, really good about the coverage this year is the fact that they don't have any commercials in their races. It's one thing that I think that's been known for a while is they really don't commercialize their races at all. So I think a lot of Formula One fans do not want to, basically a lot of Formula One fans generally per to say, they want to see basically Formula One basically stay with ESPN, NBC. And of course, you also could have the side sports guys that come in and work on that network as well. So we we'll generally have to wait and see what happens in regards to that contract, but it's probably going to be in the near future. We're probably going to find out who's going to be in the, who's going to be the network for it. I hope ESPN and ABC are the networks that do though, take it back because they have some plans and they really want to keep the coverage as they've been really getting a massive return on investment on the coverage. We're going to have to wait and see what happens, but there's a really strong possibility that that will be potentially be returning. And now we're going to head into on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about the Nice truck. Now, Cody Efa, who had a lot of insight, basically general manager of Nice Motorsports, brought out a lot of insight, including on the potential future of Nice Motorsports jumping up to the Cup Series. We did mention something in regards to the Cup Series, but about a potential team owner. So Cody Efa says there might be a Cup team owner in a Nice truck in the near future in the fifth Nice Motorsports truck. Now, I think the race that they're talking about is Mid Ohio. Now, what driver would, who is a Cup team owner? That is a former driver who's looking, I think, could potentially be it. Well, I think there's one person that comes to mind very, very quickly. And there's a big reason for this. The person I'm thinking about is Justin Marks. Now, why do I say Justin Marks? Well, number one, Justin Marks, it was a really, really awesome road course racer. And also won in Mid-Ohio. Of course, it was a rain out race. But he basically won a Mid-Ohio race in 2016 in the rain. Second reason. Justin Mars and, of course, Nice Motorsports have had a partnership this year with World Ride Express. And Daniel Suarez substituted for Mr. Carson Hosovar when he did not run the whole race at Sonoma a couple of weeks ago. Remember, Daniel Suarez, of course, had that partnership with them. And then you think about Ross Chastain, who drives for Nice Motorsports. Of course, he drives for Trackhouse Racing. And I think that Justin Marks, of course, Ross Chastain is being rumored he'll spot for the team. But I think it's going to be Justin Marks because, again, Justin Marks has a lot of road course experience. And Justin Marks, I think, has had an opportunity to go racing. He doesn't want to race in the Cup Series anymore. But I think at least a one or two off opportunity will be there. I mean, who? what other team owners or former team owner drivers are going to go? Jeff Gordon? Jeff Gordon, I don't think he's going to be in the truck anytime soon. I mean, maybe you get like someone like Brad Keselowski, perhaps. But Brad Keselowski is a Ford guy. And he drives for Fords. So he's not going to go anywhere. So it's I think it's obviously going to be... Whoever is going to be the truck, I think it's obviously going to be Justin Marks who's in the truck. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens in regards to potential announcements in the future. But it does look like right now it's very potential and very, very likely that it is going to be Justin Marks in the 41 for Nice Motorsports. We're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the future of the 10 car for Stuart Haas Racing. Now, for a lot of people who do not know at this point, Eric Amaral is going to be retiring from full-time competition and retire from NASCAR at the conclusion of the season. So they need to find a replacement for the 10 car because they're not going to sell the charter. So who are the favorites going into the 10 car currently at the moment? Well, obvious choice right now is Ryan Priest. He's a current favorite, right? Well, apparently, according to Danny McFadden, who wrote an article in regards to this, he basically says that there's another candidate that potentially could be emerging to go to the 10 car for Stuart Haas Racing. And that name is a current driver of the 98 for Stuart Haas Racing in the NASCAR Cine Series, that being Riley Hurst. These are the two guys that are apparently the favorites to go to the 10 car. But I'm not going to entirely say those are the only two favorites. Now, I think Ryan Priest obviously is the favorite. Ryan Priest, of course, it was a, is a reserve driver for Stuart Haas Racing. He's driven Stuart Haas Racing affiliated cars pretty much all year long this year. I think he's potentially going to get into the ride. But there's also a lot of theories that they're waiting until after next season when Kevin Harvick retires. Because Kevin Harvick more than likely is going to retire after the 2023 season. They think Ryan Priest is going to replace Kevin Harvick in 2024. That's what some people are thinking. However, I think there's a good chance he does that. Now, getting into Riley Hurts for a second. I would not put Riley Hurts as my second or even third choice as a person to go up. Don't get me wrong. I think Riley Herbst has absolutely improved this year in the number 98 car. But Riley Herbst is going to get eaten up in the Cup Series. He's going to be like Harrison Burton. He's going to absolutely struggle and wreck a lot of equipment, and he's going to really, really struggle. 
Then you got to think about other potential candidates. John Hunter Nemechek, perhaps. But I think John Hunter Nemechek is he's a favorite potential favorite to go to the 10. But I think John Hunter is also favorite to go to the 19 car because Martin Truex Jr. He was very close to announcing his retirement plans more likely. As Martin Truex Jr., whether we like it or not, he's probably going to retire after this season. You also got Ricky Stenhouse Jr., who's a potential candidate, but Ricky Stenhouse Jr., he right now is potentially going to return to JTG next year. He's more than likely going to be returning to that team and probably going to finish his career at JT Doherty. So those are some of the candidates. I still think Ryan Priest is the clear favorite. I'm 80-20 on that. I was 90-10 on that, but I've kind of been lowering it a little bit more, so there's been some things coming out about that. So, again, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens in regards to whoever gets the 10 car. But I'm I'm very, I will say this, I think it's probably going to be Ryan Priest. I don't see Priest going and waiting another year. I just, with him being a reserve driver in the 10 team, I just don't see Ryan Priest not going to the 10 car next year. Again, Riley Hurts would not be my first choice to go to the 10 car personally. And then you'll have another young driver there. You need a veteran driver in there like Ryan Priest. I think Ryan Priest would be absolutely, because he's the oldest driver that's available for the 10 car next year. And I think he needs to be the driver who goes into the 10 car in 2023. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the first of two major stories in today's episode, as we're going to talk about Julio Castroneves and potentially running the Daytona 500. Now, I've already talked about a story on my channel, but there has been an update to this story. So, according to Mullins reports earlier yesterday, SRX CEO Don Hawk said he has made calls to teams and received calls from teams about getting Julio Castroneves a Daytona 500 ride for next year. Hawk committed to landing Cash Nevis a ride if he won an SRX race, which he did win the race at Five Flags. And Cash Nevis said that if he won an SRX race, he'd get an opportunity to race in the Daytona 500. Now, talking about the story, Hulu Cash Nevis is not the first time we've heard Hulu Cash Nevis the same name been brought up into the world of NASCAR. Julio Cashnevis has been wanting to race in NASCAR since 2015 when he drove for Team Penske, but Roger would not let him have the opportunity to even race in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and didn't give him that opportunity. Julio Cashnevis has always has said for a while, even back in January, that he said he would like to run the Daytona 500 or run a road course. And I think he absolutely wants to run the Daytona 500 and not just race any other major event. He, I think he wants to run the big Daytona 500. And I think he's earned the right. Julio Cashnevis is, of course, an IndyCar champion and, of course, a four-time Indianapolis 500 winner. One of only four drivers who have been able to do it. And Julio Cashnevis has had an amazing career surge over the last year or two. Julio Cashnevis is 47 years old, but he's racing like he's 26 or 27 years old. Last year, he won his fourth Indianapolis 500. He also, this year, won the Royal 24 and has won an SRX race at Five Flags. And many people have been wanting him to get into a NASCAR ride. So the big question is with Julio Castroneves, what happens with Julio Castroneves and what team does he drive for? Obviously, it's going to have to be a team that does not have four rides. Team Penske could be an opportunity, but I think he's burned bridges with Team Penske. Can't be Stuart Haas Racing because Stuart Haas Racing has a four-car limit. I think these are the candidate and potential teams he could go to. First one has to be, may potentially, Spire Motorsports. Spire Motorsports only has two cars now. It's unclear what's going on with Spire going into 2023 right now, but I think that could be a potential team. Maybe the Money Team, perhaps, could be an opportunity because the Money Team is unclear what their plans are. Maybe he goes there. But I think the ride that Hulu Cash Nevis is actually going to end up in, and this is where I think he's going to end up in, is a Project 91 car that is going on with Trackhouse Racing. Justin Mark said about as recently as a couple weeks ago, he did say that basically that they are looking to potentially run 68 races with the Trackhouse Project 91 car starting next year. Of course, only this year, they're only running one race this year, and that, of course, is Watkins Glen with Kimi Raikkonen. But they want to run 68 races, including the Daytona 500. And he didn't mention Julio Cashnevis at the time. I think Julio Cashnevis has come to the mind of many individuals, and I think that would be the perfect ride to get a guy like Julio Cashnevis in. And I know it would be kind of a struggle for Julio because he never ran a super speed track, unless he does get a little bit of experience in there, but I think Cashnevis would be a great fit for the ride. And also, he's got a great personality as well. It's another thing. Julio Cashnevis brings a lot of personality. He's got a great personality, great sense of humor, and knows how to get a party start. Feeble will flock to Julio Cashnevis Racing. has become a very popular driver over the last five or six years as well, and just a legend of the sport. I think it would make no sense to not put him in the Project 91 car. The team, and also think about competitivity. We've seen how fast our super speedways. Ross Chastain and Daniel Sports both led laps in the Talladega race, and also Ross Chastain won at Talladega, and Ross Chastain was fast at Daytona, and so was Suarez. So I think ultimately, it would, if I had to put Julio Castroneves 
in a right and a betting man. I think he's going to end up in a Prodigy 91 car in 2023. And maybe he runs more races. Who knows? But I think Kastanev is just being as good as he is right now, where he's at in his career. Because he's still racing extremely well, even at the age of 47 years old, near his 50s. He's still racing great, still racing amazing. And I absolutely want to see him in the Project 91 Trackhouse car. Would make sense to me. I think he'd be a great candidate to race in that car. And maybe he'll run some more races. Who knows? But I think he absolutely needs to run the Daytona 500 with Project 91 Trackhouse Racing. He'll have a shot to win. Of course, he'll have to make the field because that car won't be charged if he enters. But I think Julio Castaneda absolutely is going to drive the Project 91 car. He'll probably not be the only driver for driving a Project 91 car. I think Jimmy Johnson at some point will drive this car as well. But I believe that Julio Castaneda will drive the Project 91 Trackhouse Racing car, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to jump onto the final major story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Chicagoland Speedway. Now, we've talked about Chicagoland Speedway quite a bit here on the channel, especially over the last couple weeks and months. We've got an update on Chicagoland Speedway, and it's a very, very good one if you're a fan of Chicago. Now, this course is only a rumor at the moment, but according to Colin Cranmore, he basically said that according to him, a season ticket holder had basically told him at basically Kansas they have been told that Kansas is going to actually lose a day, and there will only be only one day at Kansas, and it's going to be a Saturday night race on July 8th. And NASCAR is going to be making moving that other Kansas State over to Chicagoland Speedway starting in 2023. When I saw this rumor and heard this rumor, I had to ask some people around, and I actually found out this rumor actually more than likely is going to be actually true. There's other tracks that are looking currently in the Midwest at the moment that they're going to potentially be looking at but Chicagoland Speedway holy moly just a few years ago we thought Chicago Speedway was not going to have an opportunity to make its glorious return to NASCAR and I will talk about why I'm a huge why I'm huge, really happy to potentially see this track return I'm going to explain why out of all the races in the Gen 6 era what were probably some of the best you're probably thinking Chicagoland Chicagoland and Homestead are probably the two best 1.5 mile tracks in NASCAR when it came to that and we have seen the next-gen car generally race extremely well in this, basically it race extremely well on the mile and a half in the intermediate tracks. Whether it's a one-mile track up to probably a two-and-a-half, two-mile track, it has raced extremely well this year. And Chicago with Gen 6 car is great. Could you imagine a next-gen race at Chicago? I think it would be absolutely amazing. And it would put on some amazing and great racing. So I think it definitely needs to happen there. Another reason I want to see Chicago, why I think this potentially could be happening, is I think there's one big reason, is NASCAR is trying to expand into the Chicago market. We already know currently, right now as we speak, that they are trying to get into the Chicago market. They're talking about already removing Road America from the schedule to get a race in the Chicago street course. At least with this move happening, we only have one day to Kansas, which unfortunately I think Kansas had a really good race this year. But I think that NASCAR is going to start moving, but I think that they're trying to get into the Chicago market and trying to reach out to those markets, and Chicago would bring fans in. And I think fans and the city have finally realized and are finally starting to truly appreciate what we lost. Fans, I think, and team and owners and all that stuff are really appreciating what kind of racing we had. And I thought the racing was great the last couple of years. And it's a shame that the track did not return after 2019. They were actually were supposed to race there in 2020. But COVID unfortunately hit and they never got to race there. But Chicago and potentially coming back to the schedule. I mean, it just it seems like a dream come true for me. As a fan of Chicago, and I've watched a lot of races at Chicago over the last couple of years. Racing was great there. And could you imagine what the racing like the next gen? That'd be great. And again, if it does come back, though, get out to the track. Make sure the track gets out there, get the workers out. They've been working on the tracks. So it's not like they've done nothing with the track, but they need to get. To make sure you get out to the race so that Chicago can stay long term. And here's another theory I want to talk about, though, is why I think this also could also be happening. Another theory I have is I think NASCAR is starting, is going to start. We're going to see a lot less tracks with two days, and we're going to see a lot of tracks with only one day. I think if NASCAR does want to get more and more tracks on the schedule like they're making with this move, I think they're going to have to start cutting tracks with two dates. And what are the tracks I'm talking about? Well, obviously, Tax Motor Speed with the All Stars. That doesn't need to have two dates. Of course, you have right now Atlanta with two dates. I don't see Atlanta long term having two dates going forward. Phoenix has two days. And with it being the championship race, I believe that Phoenix should only have one date. And then, of course, Las Vegas. I love Las Vegas Motor Speed. I think it's a good track. That track, more than likely, I don't think, I don't even think that track personally should have two dates. And then, of course, there's other tracks that should only right now have one day at the moment, in my honest opinion. So, 
ultimately, I think it, it, this move does truly happen, which I think it really is going to happen. I think it's great for sport. And you're, and you're losing technically two Midwest states, but then you're bringing back two Midwest states. Because remember, Road America is a Midwest state, and it would go to the Chicago Street Course. And ultimately, I'm not a big fan of Chicago Street Course. If we had a basic move from Chicago Street Course, let's move over to Long Beach and race there. But I'm not sure how the race would be. But I think there's only one or two Street Course races that work. I just don't think Street Circuits generally work in NASCAR. I don't think the race is great. It's a great spectacle. But... Back to this, I think this is just amazing that Chicago is potentially going to come back to NASCAR. Just when I was a fan of NASCAR, when I grew up watching, I always looked forward to a track like Chicago. And, and being a Midwestern kid, someone from the Midwest area my whole life, Chicago was a top market and hot commodity. So I'm really excited to see what the future holds for Chicago. And just get out to the race if you're a fan of it. And ultimately, I think this is great that Chicago is looking to come back in 2023. So, anyway, that is for today's NASCAR and motorsports video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, Kirk H. Sean Sfino Fight, when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on page while let's go jump over that and comment with your thoughts on today's video. Do you think the Chicago is truly coming back to NASCAR or not? Let me know in the comments below. And do you think, when do you think, who, what team do you think Hula Cash Nevis is going to drive for? Let me know in the comments below. Later tonight on the channel will be the NASCAR Camp or Chuck Series Race. If you're from Nashville, that's going to be up on the channel later this evening. And then tomorrow on my channel, we're going to have the SRX Race. If you're from, I believe, South Boston. And then Sunday will be the Copper View pending weather for Nashville. And then Monday will be another, more likely, another NASCAR news video. There's probably going to be some NASCAR news coming out. So anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video. And I'll see you guys next time for some more great, awesome NASCAR and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.